You can open uh, your Bibles to Romans uh, chapter 14. We're going to finish this today. No matter what it takes. <laughs> Romans 14. We're going to read again uh, as we've been doing, just because the, the whole context is important. Um, so we're not just trying to read for the sake of reading, uh, but the whole context is important and uh, we'll be uh, at one point in time or another accessing uh, different verses in this passage. So uh, we're going to read Romans 14, the whole chapter, and then into the first three verses of chapter 15 once again. And we're going to endeavor to bring this to a, a culmination today. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand." One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each one, or let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives, thank, gives God thanks, and he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and arose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ." For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then let each of us, excuse me, so then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin." We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So uh, in Romans chapter 14 into chapter 15, Paul is talking about uh, Christian liberty and conscience. And the importance or how to keep unity uh, in the church when people have deferring uh, consciences, when people have deferring opinions, deferring perspectives or point of views on things that are morally neutral. 
And uh, he uses here food, drink, and days uh, as his three examples of this uh, that was going on in this church at this time. And uh, so we've been doing a study on this, and uh, I want you to remember that when you're, when, when you're talking about uh, any moral decision in your life, it's going to fall into one of three categories. It's either going to be something that God has explicitly commanded in the Scripture, or it's going to be something that God has explicitly forbidden in Scripture, or it's going to be this third area that we've called, or theologians have called, the adiaphora, matters of indifference, where God has not directly spoken to that matter, and therefore it is an, an area of Christian liberty where you are at liberty in areas where God has not spoken to make your own decision, to, to make up your own conscience in that area and follow your own conscience in those things. And, 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 and again, every moral decision you're ever going to make is going to fall into one of those three categories. And here he's dealing with, again, the adiaphora, the things that are indifferent, the morally neutral issues, that there is no command or, uh, or, or forbidding it from Scripture. I think to, before we get into it today, what I want to do is I just want to give just a brief, a very brief, we haven't done this yet, but a very brief summary of what we mean by Christian liberty and Christian freedom. And really, what I hope that you get out of this teaching, if you get nothing else out of it, I hope that you get this much out of it. So I'm just going to make a quick summation here, and then we're going to continue with where we left off, exactly where we left off last week. So let's talk about Christian freedom or Christian liberty. When, when we talk about that... Number one, there's things that Christ has freed us from. And, and there's, there's a host of things, but just to summarize, He's freed us from the, the power of sin. He's freed us from the penalty of sin, the wrath of God. He has freed us from the curse of the law. And then He's freed us from the power of Satan, the dominion of Satan. And then there's things that He has freed us to. He's freed us to walk with Him. He's freed us to have free fellowship with the Father through Him so that we can approach the Father with confidence, with courage, with uh, knowing that we're accepted in the Beloved and there's, there's, not this, there's nothing between us and God. We can just approach Him freely and fully because of Christ's atoning work for us. So there's things He's freed us from, there's things He's freed us to. That's Christian liberty, Christian freedom. But a part of that Christian liberty, and this is what He's really addressing in these chapters here, as well as 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10, is He's dealing, uh, dealing or most of chapter 10 and most of chapter 9, not necessarily all of it. Uh, and, and so He's dealing with this idea of Christian liberty, Christian freedom in this sense. That we as believers in Christ are free from the scruples, from the opinions, from the consciences of other people. My conscience is not bound by you. Paul says it this way. He asked the question, why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? Who are you? to judge my liberty? Who are you to tread upon my conscience with your conscience? And, and this is the area of freedom that we have that, that really protects us as believers. It, it, it is uh, very closely associated with the, the idea or the teaching of, um, of Scripture alone or sola scriptura, right? Scripture alone. Because this protects us that you cannot impose upon my conscience something that the Bible does not explicitly state. And I, this especially applies for leadership, for pastors, for elders, for leaders of church denominations, I cannot impose my conscience upon you. I cannot impose my scruples, my opinions. I can't impose those things upon you beyond the Scriptures, right? I can only command what the Scriptures command. I can only forbid what the Scriptures forbid. I cannot forbid or command beyond the Scriptures. 
And that protects you from the abuse of church leadership. And believe me, there's a lot of abuse of church leadership in the world today. A lot of abusive denominations where they are binding people's consciences all the time to their scruples, to their opinions, to their beliefs that they hold to that are beyond the scriptures themselves. So this is designed to protect you, to protect me. We are, this should be an encouraging message to know that we are free from other people's opinions, their expectations, their traditions, the commandments of men, the doctrines of men, the things that they want to push upon us. We are free from those things in Christ. We are not subject to that. And so there's great freedom and great liberty in this that, that, uh, that we in leadership cannot bind your conscience. We cannot control your conscience. We can't hold you captive to anything beyond the Word of God. And that's what I hope that you get out of this, uh, if nothing else, is that freedom and that liberty that uh, it, it really doesn't matter at the end of the day what other people's opinions are, what other people's consciences are, what other people's scruples are. What matters at the end of the day is the Lord is the Lord of your conscience. And your conscience is only captive to the Word of God and not to all of these other things that people attach to it. So with that, we're going to pick up again where we left off last week. So Paul... Uh, talks about this division that's happening in the church in Rome, and it's between two groups. You have the weak brothers, and you got the strong brothers, the weak sisters and the strong sisters. And he's addressing these two parties in the church, the weak and the strong. And so what we're doing is we're doing exactly that. We're, gonna, we're separating, if you will, the weak and the strong. And we're asking you the question, or we asked you the question last week, are you the weak... Or are you the strong? Do you have a lot of scruples, a lot of lists, a lot of things that you think are sins that are not necessarily found in Scripture? Do you have an overactive conscience, uh, a super sensitive conscience? Uh, or are you the stronger brother? Your list is smaller. Um, you, your, your conscience is confined to Scripture. You only don't allow what the Scriptures don't allow. You only command what the Scriptures command. And you just stick within the confines of Scripture. Are you the weaker or are you the stronger? And what we're doing is we're separating and now what we're addressing, uh, addressing right now, the strong. We asked three questions last week. Uh, I'm not going to go over those three questions again. We went over them last week. We're going to pick up with question number four. And then I think there's one more after that. And then we're going to go into the week and we're going to have questions for the week. So this is meant to be a, a sermon that is self-reflective, that causes you to pause and think Reflect on yourself. Am I the strong? Am I the weak? And if I'm the strong, let me hear these questions. If I'm the weak, let me hear these questions and let me self-assess. So the fourth question is this. For the strong, speaking to the strong now, ask yourself when it comes to a matter of Christian liberty, is this helpful and can I do it to the glory of God? Is this helpful and can I do it to the glory of God? And where I'm pulling this from is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read verses 23 and 24. And then I'm going to read verses 31 through 33. And this is going to, uh, to talk about this very thing. You know, Again, in matters of liberty, uh, is it something that is helpful and does it give glory to God? He says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. And I apologize. I don't know what's wrong with my throat this morning, uh, but it, uh, it wasn't like this last night. Um, so anyway, all things are lawful for me. When he says all things are lawful for me, he doesn't mean things that God has said in his word are unlawful. Right? 
uh, adultery is not lawful, um, murder is not lawful, theft is not lawful, stealing is not lawful, bearing false witness is not lawful, gossip is not lawful, slander is not right. You can make a whole long list of things that are not lawful because God says they're not lawful. What he means by all things are lawful is all things that God has not defined in his word as being unlawful. So all these other things, again, primarily dealing with food, with drink and days, observation of days, in those things, all things are lawful for me. But he goes on from there. He doesn't end there. He says, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. So here, here comes the question. There may be something that I can do, that I have Christian liberty and freedom to do, but he wants me to ask myself, is this area, is it going to be helpful to me and helpful to others? And is it going to edify me and edify others around me? And this is the question we have to ask. The next question we have to ask in verse 24 is this. He says, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. So the next question he wants us to ask is, is this area of liberty or freedom, is it going to be something that I'm doing that's going to seek your well-being? Is it going to benefit you? Is it going to help you? Right? We, we, we've kind of talked about this a little bit uh, in, in past weeks. But when it comes to these areas of Christian liberty and freedom, the issue that Paul deals with more than is it right or is it wrong, it's morally neutral. Uh, more than the right and wrong, what he deals with is, is it helpful? Is it going to edify? Does it bring peace? Um, is it building up the church? Is it tearing down the church? Is it causing disputes and arguments in the church? Or is it something that we're working together toward peace and mutual edification? Right? And, and that's what he's more concerned about is that there's peace, there's helpfulness, there's edification taking place, that we're seeking one another's well-being uh, in the local fellowship. He says in verse 31, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, right? That's kind of a summary of, of Christian liberty, the things you eat, the things you drink, the things you do. He says, do all to the glory of God. And so there's your next question. Can I say that what I'm eating, what I'm drinking, what I'm doing is being done for the glory of God? He says, verse 32, give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks, that's the Gentiles, or to the church of God. So he, he names three people groups here. Jews, Gentiles, the church of God. And he's saying, give no offense to them. Meaning, if I'm trying to minister to the Jews, I don't want to give offense to the Jews by violating their customs and laws. If I'm ministering to the Gentiles, I don't want to impose Jewish custom and Jewish laws upon the Gentiles who were never under the law. So I'm not going to do that there. And when it comes to the church, if I'm, if I'm trying to minister to this church, I don't want to give offense to this church in unnecessary issues. There's going to be plenty of offense that's going to be given just from preaching the word. We don't want to give offense to those we're trying to help and reach in unnecessary things. So we have to ask ourselves, is this area of liberty, is it going to cause an offense to be given to the person that I'm trying to help? Is it going to give offense to, to my husband, to my wife, to, to my kids, to my, my church mate, to uh, the person at work that I work with? Is it, going to, is it going to give offense to them? Is it going to be a stumbling block? And if so, I need to consider that. And then lastly, in verse 33, I love this verse. He says, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. So Paul, when it comes to wanting or seeing the salvation of all peoples, he is a people pleaser. He is a monster people pleaser when it comes to bringing people to a place of salvation. And the question here that we have to ask, and I think this is very probing, this, this one ministers to me greatly. Am I putting my liberty before the gospel and the salvation of another person? 
Because you'll remember we talked about this, I think, two weeks ago, 1 Corinthians 9.23, where he talked about becoming all things to all men, that he may win some. And he says in that context, now this I do for the gospel's sake. Meaning he put the gospel before his, his preferences, before his liberties, before his convictions. He held his convictions loosely and he put the gospel first for the, the sake of the salvation of people. I remember uh, in preparing for this, uh, this sermon, I came across a, uh, a neat testimony that I thought was worth sharing with you. And it's uh, the, the testimony of the conversion of Rosaria Butterfield. You can look her up online and get the full testimony. Um, hopefully I don't badger it too much. Uh, anyway, Rosaria Butterfield was a lesbian professor at Syracuse University. Very progressive, highly progressive. And um, she was in a, in a lesbian relationship at that time, a committed one uh, with, with another lady. And uh, a pastor had reached out to her, and I think through, through means of a letter, and uh, she felt that, and, and I'm assuming that because she was an educator, that she felt like in, uh, in the world of academics, you have to hear the opposing point of view. So she entertained this letter, and it led to her being invited over to this pastor and his wife's house for supper. So she goes there, and uh, when, she, when she goes, not knowing what to expect... So you have, on the one hand, you have this leftist professor who's a lesbian in a relationship. And then on the other hand, you've got this Bible-believing conservative Christian. And they're inviting her over into the house and, and having a meal with her. So what they do is the pastor and his wife, they prepare only vegetables. And, uh, you know, leftist, she's, you know... Not that you have to be a leftist to, to be just, uh, you know, eating vegetables and, you know, hey, we can't have so many cows running around because, you know, they fart and pollute the air and, you know, global warming happens, you know. Uh, <laughs> so she's, she's, she's on that spectrum. So, so they, don't, they don't prepare any meat, you know. They didn't, they didn't say, hey, we're free. We have liberty. We're going to prepare, uh, you know, pork chops and... Uh, you know, ham hocks, and we're going to just, you know, you know, pork sausages and everything else. No, they, they catered to her, and they, they fed her only vegetables. And, and then uh, they didn't run their air conditioner because she's, you know, concerned about uh, the, the, the climate and the weather and, you know, uh, uh, the atmosphere and so on and so forth. So they didn't run their air conditioner. You know, they didn't practice liberty. Hey, I'm going to turn my air conditioner to 68 and freeze this, this lefty out, you know. Uh, that would have been the, the opinion of some, some Christians, right? We're just gonna, we're gonna teach this lefty a lesson. We're gonna freeze her out and feed her just a bunch of greens, uh, feed her all pork and stuff. They didn't do that. They catered to her. They fed her only vegetables. They turned the air off. They, they catered to her. Um, and, and they, 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 they created this dialogue. And, and over the course of time, uh, I think it was in 1999, she converted to Christ. And to this day, she is a pastor's wife. Uh, her, pa her husband pastors a Presbyterian church in North Carolina. And uh, she homeschools her kids. And she, um, she now is a defender of the, uh, the biblical position of womanhood. I mean, glory to God. That, that's quite a big change from uh, a leftist professor uh, who's a feminist and in a lesbian relationship. And that's the power of Christ to change of life, change a life. But I often think, what if, what if that pastor was a total jerk and just brought her in and flaunted his liberties and said, I'm going to teach you lefties a lesson and this is how we do things around here and you better like it. We don't care how you feel. And I often wonder if that would have either hindered her from being saved as soon as that she was or, you know, what all would have happened if they would have had that attitude? And that's, that's what Paul is dealing with here. Yes, we have liberty. Is it helpful? Does it edify? Are you seeking the good of others? We have liberty, but can you do everything that you're doing to the glory of God? Are you giving offense to someone you're trying to reach that has a conscience about it? Uh, are, you, are you putting your liberties before the gospel and before the salvation of those who you're trying to reach? 
So these, these are probing questions that, that I think need to be answered. So as we, as we uh, exercise our liberty, we're doing it with the mindset that we are aware of other people and trying to minister to them takes preeminence and priority over my liberty. The fifth question that we had, uh, we asked three last week, uh, and that was the fourth question. The fifth question we have uh, to the strong is this, and, and it kind of ties into our opening uh, that we made just a moment ago about Christian freedom. But am I keeping the gospel and Christ's redemption of me at the center of my understanding about Christian liberty? But the, the primary focus of Christian liberty is not all the liberty we have and all of these other things that people can't bind us to, which is a good thing. Um, it, it's not primarily that, but it's primarily this freedom from sin and Satan. It, it's primarily this freedom to worship God and fellowship with Him and walk with Him. And this freedom to serve Christ. And the gospel gives us, this is the beauty of Christian liberty is the beauty of Christian liberty is, is that it, it allows me this flexibility of conscience so that whether I'm trying to reach a Jew or a Gentile, whether I'm trying to reach an American or whether I'm trying to reach a, a, a Chinese or an Indonesian or an Italian or whoever I'm trying to, to minister to, whoever I'm trying to reach, I can be adaptable and flexible to their customs, to their cultures, to their, to their norms, to their, uh, their matters of conscience that are not explicitly forbidden or commanded in Scripture. Does that make sense? It frees me to have that flexibility of conscience in these different scenarios so that I can reach them. You have no fle if, you can't, if you can't minister to anybody outside of your culture, or outside, of your, uh, outside of your conscience and, and what you think is right or wrong in these matters of conscience and these areas of scruples, if you can't minister to anybody else outside of it, who are you going to minister to? Right? If, if the only people I can minister to are people that are just like me and think just like me, then, then what good am I going to be? Because part of the Great Commission is going to press you to, to go and speak to people that are not like you, that don't think like you, that don't look like you, that don't believe like you. And, and this gives us this flexibility of conscience uh, to be able to minister to them. And that's the beauty of it. So you want to keep the gospel and what Christ has done for us in redemption at the forefront or at the center of your understanding of Christian liberty. And practice that. Uh, one scripture I will give you um, before we move on to talking about the weaker brother and addressing the weaker brother is in Romans 14 verse 17 in the text that we're studying. I love this. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not all these peripheral external things he says it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. In other words, he gets to the fact that Christianity is a heart religion. It's not an external religion. It's not about all these external observances. Am I treating you rightly? Uh, am I a peaceable person to be around or am I a pain in the butt to be around? Am I a peaceable person to be around or, or am I a contentious, overbearing individual to be around? Am I a joyful person to be around or am I a person that just, you know, I'm mopey and complaining all the time and everything's a negative thing or am I a joyful, delightful person to be around? And I think what Paul's getting at is this, it's not, this, the church is not supposed to be about all these other things. Wouldn't you want to go to a church where everybody treats everyone rightly, where everyone is peaceable? And everyone is joyful. I mean, that, 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 that's where I want to be. That's the church I want to go to. I, I don't want to go to the church that's filled with disputes and arguings and contentions and strife. And, you know, people are overbearing and forcing their conscience upon you and all of these other things. I want to go to a place where there's liberty, where there's freedom, where there's peace and joy abounding, where people treat one another rightly. And that's what Paul is saying. It's not about all of these other things. And, and so we get back to the, the, the core of Christianity. You know, are you being fruitful? Right? The Lord called us to bear fruit and fruit that remains. So are we being fruitful in, in our Christian life? I know as you can observe, like I 
like a million and one external observances. You can go get ashes put on your head on Ash Wednesday. You, you can keep you know, the Lenten season and fast all of these things for 40 days. You, you can do all of those things, but you know, if there's no fruit being born in your life, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, all of these things, if those things aren't being born in your life, it's all for nothing. It's all just religious observances. It's, it's not, it's not going to merit anything. It's not going to have any value. So now we're going to turn our attention to the weaker brother, okay? So the, or the weaker sister. So if you, if you may be in the weaker um, side of things, or there might be areas you're strong and areas you're weak, and, and that's very possible too. So we're going to deal with the weak now. We're going to ask questions of the weak. The, the first question is this for the weak. Is this, do you judge other people based on your scruple? Whatever your scruple is, do you judge other people based on your scruple? Now we have seen before in Romans 14 verse 3, this is the primary issue with the weaker brother. The weaker brother is a judge. Verse 3, it says, let not him who eats, that's, that's uh, the him who eats is the strong, despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat, that's the weak, judge him who eats, for God has received him. So the, the, the inclination of the, of the weak brother is to judge the strong. They see the, the strong exercising their liberties, and they judge it as being sin, right? Because, because what you judge is what you deem as sin or wrong. And so the, the weak brother sees the, the strong brother in their liberty and judges them as having sinned. In fact, so much so that Paul has to point out that God has received him. What, what is he saying? In other words, the weak person the weak person is not even sure the strong person is saved. We're not even sure the strong person is a believer in Christ. We're not even sure that he has uh, been received by God. And he's saying, no, God's received the strong brother. Okay, You don't have to judge the strong. Okay, You can give up your judging. A second uh, part of that question, you know, if you're weak, do you judge people by your scruple? In other words, in other words to say, another way to say this would be, Boy, if they only did this, whatever your scruple is, insert scruple, if they just did this, they'd be a good Christian. They'd be a real Christian, a real Bible-believing Christian. If they just did insert whatever your scruple is, then they'd be a good Christian. So, so we want to give up judging in these matters of doubtful things. The, uh, the second part of that is this. Do you view your scruple... As, how can we say, do you view your scruple as the measure or the standard by which you judge one person's salvation or sanctification? And, and to, to bear this out, I think the, the best scripture that comes to me that I think is phenomenal uh, about this is Galatians chapter 4. If you'll just listen to me, Galatians chapter 4, verses 9 through 11 in the book of Galatians, what's taking place is Paul, he has preached the gospel. He's gone to them and he has declared to them uh, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. That's Acts 13, verse 38 and 39. That's the gospel that Paul preached in Galatia. He leaves, when he leaves, these Judaizers come in behind him, and they preach another gospel. They say, no, uh, faith in Christ is not enough. You have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, and only then can you be saved. So they took the law of Moses and made the law of Moses a requirement for salvation and sanctification. That if you wanted to be saved and sanctified, you would have to keep the law of Moses to do so. And that's what's going on in the church of Galatia. And so Paul comes to them and he says, But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, 
How is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? The weak and beggarly elements is a reference to the Old Testament law. He calls it weak and beggarly because it is unable to save and it is unable to sanctify. It has no ability to save. It has no ability to sanctify. And they're wanting to go back to these weak and beggarly elements and be in bondage again to them. And he says, he, he makes it clear what he's talking about. He says, you observe days, that would be the Sabbath, months and seasons and years. Uh, season, months and seasons would be uh, the feast days like Passover. Uh, the years would be sabbatical years. Every seventh year was a sabbatical year. And then every seventh sabbatical year, you'd have the year of Jubilee. And they were observing these things. And this is Paul's response to them. Just, just listen to this response. He says, I am afraid for you. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Now, you, you would think, why is Paul getting so upset about these people, you know, worried about Sabbath observance, feast days, years, you know, all of these different things. They're keeping the, uh, the uh, ceremonial aspects of the law. Why is Paul so concerned about this? Because they were making it an issue of salvation and sanctification. That if you didn't do these things, you either weren't saved, you weren't justified before God, or you weren't being sanctified. You weren't in this progress of sanctification that's taking place. And so when, when this happens, Paul is belligerent. He, uh, Galatians is where Paul says some of the harshest, strongest statements in all of the scriptures. And he is concerned for them. He doesn't applaud them and say... You know, I'm happy for you. You found the roots of Christianity. Uh, I'm so happy for you that you're, you, you're, you found the roots of Judaism and you're digging down into it. No, he, he rebukes them. He says, I'm afraid for you. I, I don't even know if you're saved or not. Because all my work is in vain if you're thinking this is what's going to save you. If you think this is what's going to justify you, I'm afraid for you and I may have labored in vain. So we can't make our scruples the, uh, the standard by which we measure a person's salvation or sanctification. Uh, the, uh, the next question uh, is, ask yourself, this is a good one, ask yourself, am I forcing my scruple upon another person? Am I forcing my scruple upon another person? Am I holding other people hostage to my weak conscience? Right? And this, this very often happens. This seems to be what was happening in, in Romans because in verses 3 through 9, Paul is primarily dealing with uh, the weaker brother. And then verses 13 to the end of the chapter, he's dealing primarily with the stronger brother. But when he addresses the weak, he says this, Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks, and he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. What Paul is getting at here is whether you're observing or not, it's to the Lord. Whether you're eating or not, it's to the Lord. You're giving God thanks in either case. In other words, mind your own business. Don't try to force your scruple on another person. Don't be convinced in your own mind. Make your own mind up about this and live by that. Don't try to push it on somebody else and make them bound to your scruple or bind them to your conscience. If they observe it, they observe it to the Lord. If they don't, they don't do it before the Lord. It's the same, it's the same thing, right? So that's, that's number two. Number three, and this is one of my favorite ones is this, is ask yourself, this is so important, I think, uh, I think too often we miss this point. 
because we're so busy uh, pointing out the faults of the liberal that we don't see the faults of the conservative. And that, that question is this. You have to ask yourself, again, talking to the weaker brother, are you narrower than the Bible? Are you narrower than the Bible? See, there, there's more than one way to be unbiblical. You can be unbiblical by being broader than the Bible, by going beyond the Scriptures, going outside of it, and denying the gospel and denying God's moral commandments. You, you can do that. But you can be narrower than the Bible too. And you can add a whole lot of laws and a whole lot of rules and a whole lot of traditions and a whole lot of customs to the word of God as well. And you would be as equally unbiblical as the person that is broader than the Bible. So I'm going to give you just some examples real quickly and then we'll wrap this up and close. Um, give you some examples of what it means to be narrower than the Bible and examples of what it means to be broader than the Bible. And then somewhere in the middle there is the truth, where we're supposed to be, right? In other words, we as a church, we don't want to be broader than the Bible, but we also don't want to be narrower than the Bible. We just want to be what the Bible is, what the Bible states. We just want to come down, right? Whatever boundaries the Bible sets, that's the boundaries we want. We don't want to add boundaries to it. We don't want to take boundaries away. Which, wherever the Word of God falls down, that's where we want to be. We don't want to, again, we've talked about this before and this is so important. We don't want to confuse our preferences or our convictions with God's commandments. And we don't want to confuse our traditions with the Scriptures. You have to always separate those two because if you don't, you're going to confuse the two together like the Pharisees did and you'll end up fighting for your convictions and your traditions like it's the Scripture. And that's what we don't want. We, we want to, wherever the Scripture is, that's where we're going to be. We're not going to be broader or narrower. So some examples of this, and then we'll bring this to a conclusion. There's some other questions, but we can, we can deal with it some other time down the road. One example of, uh, of this would be, uh, so let's take narrower first, okay? There are some uh, that would say that you have to have, on the Lord's Day, Sunday, Two services. You have to have a Sunday morning and a Sunday afternoon or a Sunday evening service. You have to do that. Well, first of all, let's just back up and get a historical perspective from Scripture. The, the church did begin to assemble on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, also known as the Lord's Day, the day the Lord was resurrected from the grave. That's why the church began to assemble on, us on Sundays. And they more than likely met Sunday afternoons or Sunday evenings and not Sunday morning. And the reason why I say that is because Sunday was the first day of the week. It is the first day of the week. It was then, it is now. So the Sabbath had passed. The day of rest was gone. It was the first, everybody was back to work on Sunday. So they'd have been working Sunday and go to church Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening after work hours or after farming or whatever you were doing. Right? And so more than likely, they were just meeting in the, in the Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening sometime, not in the morning. Us, in our culture, we're meeting in the morning. Because for us, the way our culture was set up, Sundays was, was the day of rest. And so it became that way, and we were able to, uh, to, to have Sunday morning services. So that's, that's one. It's too narrow. Right? There's no scripture that binds your conscience to say there has to be two Sunday morning service, service, or two services. It, it is a matter of indifference. If you want to do it, fine. And if you don't, fine. Where is it broader? If we were to say that it didn't matter, your Sunday attendance at church didn't matter anymore, then that's wrong too. Because we have, again, Hebrews 10, I believe it's verse 25, where he says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some have become. The word manner means habit. Uh, you don't want it to be a habit that you're no longer in church uh, on the Lord's Day, worshiping with the saints, partaking of the Word of God with the saints. You don't want to ever let that happen. Right? It can become habit-forming. 
So, so we don't want to go so broad now that well, it doesn't matter if you're here on Sundays. No, that's too broad. We have Scripture. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. So we draw the line there. We don't make it narrower than that. We don't make it broader than that. Does that make sense to you? Okay. I remember, for example, when, when our church first left the denomination that it was a part of, and I was talking to, to other denominations and, and, and other churches and people in, in these other groups that, that would have liked to have had us join with them. And it was always amazing how immediately scruples would come into play. Uh, because the one, you know, they were saying, well, you'd have to have two Sunday services. You could never just have one. You'd have to have two. And then, and then you'd have to, you'd have to, you know, half of your songs would have to be from the book of Psalms. So half of your singing in church would have to be from the book of Psalms. And so all these stipulations were rolled out that, that you had to do all of these things you know, in order to be a good church, you know, in order to be one of their churches, you, you had to do these different things. See, it's, it's, it's taking the Bible and making it narrower than where the Bible stands. Uh, another example would be narrower. Uh, you can never drink any type of wine or alcoholic beverage. That, that's narrower than the Bible, right? Um, Jesus drank wine, he turned the water into wine, he served wine, there's going to be wine in the kingdom of God. Wine is a type of salvation, wine is a type of the blessing of God in Scripture. So that's narrower to say that, but, but it, it's broader to say that it doesn't matter if you're drunk with wine. Because we have Scripture, Ephesians 5.18, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. So it would be wrong to say that it's okay to be drunk with wine. It's, it's not okay to be drunk. Uh, that, that shows a lack of temperance and self-control. So you have one where it's narrower, and now you have one that's broader. You just want to be where the Bible is. Does that make sense to you? One more. The, the issue of uh, uh, women in the ministry and what can women do in the church? Uh, what, what things can women do uh, in the church? Uh, it would be narrower to say that uh, you know, women can't pray or women can't uh, sing or you know, get up and lead a song or read from the scripture. Uh, that, that would be narrower than the Bible. We have you know, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 5, women were praying and prophesying in the church. We have Aquila and Priscilla, husband and wife team that spoke with Apollos and showed him a, a more thorough understanding of the scriptures because he'd only known the baptism of John. And this is after Christ's resurrection and so on. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's sort of like narrow where some people would like to just tell the women, put your hats on, sit in the corner and shut up. You know, that, that's kind of the, the doctrine some churches for women. That's, what, that's about what they can do. Well, that's, that's narrower than the Bible. What's broader than the Bible? The, it's broader than the Bible to say that women can be pastors or elders. Because there's no biblical example of any woman pastor or any woman elder in the church at all in the Bible, period. Uh, all, the, uh, all the requirements that are uh, listed for an elder are given to men. Uh, all the examples of pastors and elders we have in the church are to men. So church leadership is reserved for men. So it would be broader to say that, you know, we, we, can, uh, you know, we can have pa women pastors and elders today. Well, if so, if that's the case, then you would be the first example of one because we don't have any biblical example of one. And now see, you're broader than the Bible. But it's narrower to the Bible to, to, to say that women, you know, they can't, can't sing a song, they can't pray in public, they can't read a scripture in public, they can't do all of these other things. No, what does the scripture say? It does say, uh, 1 Timothy 2.12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. He's talking about in the local assembly. So he's talking about in the local assembly, he's not permitting a woman to be in a place of authority and teaching in an authoritative position over the entire church. Right? That would be an eldership role. That would be a pastor's role. And that's where we draw the line, because that's, that's where the scripture draws the line. We don't, we don't exceed that. 
We don't broaden it out and say, well, that's just back then. We're going to broaden it out. But we don't make it narrower either. We don't make it narrower either. And the temptation, hear me, as conservatives, is for us to get narrower than what the Bible is. That's our tendency, is to, to strap burdens on people that the Bible doesn't have, to make restrictions that the Bible doesn't have, but it looks good because it's conservative. And, and, and that's what we have to avoid. Just, just fall down where the Bible falls down and don't exceed that and don't be narrower than that in any way. And I think, I think if we do that, we should be able to steer the ship in the right direction and, and, uh, and, and keep unity within the church by just following this, the, the scriptures. I have two more questions. I'm not going to get to them today because I already went past the time that I wanted to and my voice is failing uh, fast. So I don't want to speak anymore. And you're probably happy about that. So, <laughs> so let's, uh, let's pray. Uh, when we come back next week, I'm not really sure uh, what we're going to do. Um, I have some more material on the subject of church unity. So I, I might take that up for one or two more weeks. Uh, we'll see. We're, we're getting close to Resurrection Sunday and, and Good Friday. So we got some good stuff coming up here. Let's, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we do appreciate you. We thank you for uh, the teaching of Scripture. We're glad that uh, we have liberty in Christ, that people cannot bind our consciences anymore. We are, we're free from people's opinions, free from people's scruples and traditions and customs and commandments that they have. Uh, we don't have to abide by those, but we do have to abide by Scripture. And, and we do have to follow Scripture where Scripture speaks to us. And uh, we do have to follow that. And we can't, uh, we can't be, as we said, broader or narrower than the Bible. Uh, Lord, help us to just fall in love with you and fall in love with your word. And to, uh, to not add or take away from what the Scriptures say. And we thank you, Father, for these things. Continue to teach us, continue to lead us, to guide us, to help us to further enlighten us in, in coming weeks, months, and years. And we thank you that nothing that we do for you, Lord, will be in vain. In Jesus' name, amen.